or a bird that carries hatred and resentment. The only animals that may occasionally experience something akin to negativity or show signs of neurotic behavior are those that live in dose contact with humans, and so link into the human mind and its insanity. Watch any plant or animal and let it teach you acceptance of what is, surrender to the now. Let it teach you being. Let it teach you integrity which means to be one, to be yourself, to be real. Let it teach you how to live and how to die, and how not to make living and dying into a problem. I have lived with several Zen masters all of them cats. Even ducks have taught me important spiritual lessons. Lust watching them is a meditation. How peacefully they float along, at ease with themselves, totally present in the now, ignified and perfect as only a mindless creature can be. Occasionally, however, two ducks will get into a fight sometimes for no apparent reason, or because one duck has strayed into another's private space. The fight usually lasts only for a few seconds, and then the ducks separate, swim off in opposite directions, and vigorously flap their wings a few times. They then continue to swim on peacefully, as if the fight had never happened. When I observed that for the first time, I suddenly realized that by flapping their wings, they were releasing surplus energy, thus preventing it from becoming trapped in their body and turning into negativity. This is natural wisdom, and it is easy for them because they do not have a mind that keeps the past alive unnecessarily, and then builds an identity around it. Couldn't a negative emotion also contain an important message? For example, if I often feel depressed, it may be a signal that there is something wrong with my life, and it may force me to look at my life situation and make some changes. So I need to listen to what the emotion is telling me, and not just dismiss it as negative. When you have reached a certain degree of presence, you don't need negativity anymore to tell you what is needed in your life situation. But as long as negativity is there, use it. Use it as a kind of signal that reminds you to be more present. How do we stop negativity from arising? And how do we get rid of it once it is there? As I said, you stop it from arising by being fully present. But don't become discouraged. There are as yet few people on the planet who can sustain a state of continuous presence, although some are getting close to it. Soon, I believe there will be many more. Whenever you notice that some form of negativity has arisen within you, look on it not as a failure, but as a helpful signal that is telling you. Wake up. Get out of your mind. Be present. There is a novel by Aldous Huxley called Island, written in his later years when he became very interested in spiritual teachings. It tells the story of a man shipwrecked on a remote island cut off from the rest of the world. This island contains a unique civilization. The unusual thing about it is that its inhabitants, unlike those of the rest of the world, are actually sane. The first thing that the man notices are the colorful parrots perched in the trees and they seem to be constantly croaking the words attention. Here and now. Attention. Here and now. We later learned that the islanders taught them these words in order to be reminded continuously to stay present. So whenever you feel negativity arising within you, whether caused by an external factor, a thought, or even nothing in particular that you are aware of, look on it as a voice saying attention. Here and now. Wake up. Even the slightest irritation is significant and needs to be acknowledged and looked at. Otherwise, there will be a cumulative buildup of unobserved reactions. As I said before, you may be able to just drop it once you realize that you don't want to have this energy field inside you and that it serves no purpose. But then make sure that you drop it completely. If you cannot drop it, just accept that it is there and take your attention into the feeling. As I pointed out earlier, what is the purpose of the irritation? None whatsoever. Why did you create it? You didn't. The mind did. It was totally automatic, totally unconscious. Why did the mind create it? Because it holds the unconscious belief that it's resistance, which you experience as negativity or unhappiness in some form, will somehow dissolve the undesirable condition. This, of course, is a delusion. The resistance that it creates, the irritation or anger in this case, is far more disturbing than the original cause that it is attempting to dissolve. All this can be transformed into spiritual practice. Feel yourself becoming transparent, as it were, without the solidity of a material body. Now allow the noise, 
or whatever causes a negative reaction to pass right through you. It is no longer hitting a solid wall inside you. As I said, practice with little things first. The car alarm, the dog barking, the children screaming, the traffic jam. Instead of having a wall of resistance inside you that gets constantly and painfully hit by things that should not be happening, let everything pass through you. Somebody says something to you that is rude or designed to hurt. Instead of going into unconscious reaction and negativity, such as attack, defense, or withdrawal, you let it pass right through you. Offer no resistance. It is as if there is nobody there to get hurt anymore. That is forgiveness. In this way, you become invulnerable. I have been practicing meditation. I have been to workshops. I have read many books on spirituality. I try to be in a state of non-resistance, but if you ask me whether I have found true and lasting inner peace, my honest answer would have to be no. Why haven't I found it? What else can I do? You are still seeking outside, and you cannot get out of the seeking mode. Maybe the next workshop will have the answer. Maybe that new technique. To you I would say, don't look for peace. Don't look for any other state than the one you are in now. Otherwise, you will set up inner conflict and unconscious resistance. Forgive yourself for not being at peace. The moment you completely accept your non-peace, your non-peace becomes transmuted into peace. Anything you accept fully will get you there, will take you into peace. This is the miracle of surrender. You may have heard the phrase turn the other cheek, which a great teacher of enlightenment used 2,000 years ago. He was attempting to convey symbolically the secret of non-resistance and non-reaction. In this statement, as in all his others, he was concerned only with your inner reality, not with the outer conduct of your life. Do you know the story of Banzan? Before he became a great Zen master, he spent many years in the pursuit of enlightenment, but it eluded him. Then one day, as he was walking in the marketplace, he overheard a conversation between a butcher and his customer. Give me the best piece of meat you have, said the customer. And the butcher replied, every piece of meat I have is the best. There is no piece of meat here that is not the best. Upon hearing this, Banzan became enlightened. I can see you are waiting for some explanation. When you accept what is, every piece of meat every moment is the best. That is enlightenment. The nature of compassion. Having gone beyond the mind made opposites, you become like a deep lake. The outer situation of your life and whatever happens there is the surface of the lake. Sometimes calm, sometimes windy and rough, according to the cycles and seasons. Deep down, however, the lake is always undisturbed. You can enjoy them, play with them, create new forms, appreciate the beauty of it all. But there will be no need to attach yourself to any of it when you become this detached. Does it not mean that you also become remote from other human beings? On the contrary, as long as you are unaware of being, the reality of other humans will elude you, because you have not found your own. Your mind will like or dislike their form, which is not just their body, but includes their mind as well. True relationship becomes possible only when there is an awareness of being. Coming from being, you will perceive another person's body and mind as just a screen, as it were in which you can feel their true reality, as you feel yours. So, when confronted with someone else's suffering or unconscious behavior, you stay present and in touch with being, and are thus able to look beyond the form, and feel the other person's radiant and pure being through your own. At the level of being, all suffering is recognized as an illusion. Suffering is due to identification with form. Miracles of healing sometimes occur through this realization by awakening being consciousness in others if they are ready. Is that what compassion is? Yes. Compassion is the awareness of a deep bond between yourself and all creatures. But there are two sides to compassion, two sides to this bond. On the one hand, since you are still here as a physical body, you share the vulnerability and mortality of your physical form with every other human and with every living being. Next time you say, I have nothing in common with this person, Remember that you have a great deal in common. A few years from now, two years or 70 years, it doesn't make much difference both of you will have become rotting corpses, then piles of dust, then nothing at all. This is a sobering and humbling realization that leaves little room for pride. Is this a negative thought? No, it is a fact. Why close your eyes to it? In that sense, 
There is total equality between you and every other creature. One of the most powerful spiritual practices is to meditate deeply on the mortality of physical forms, including your own. This is called, die before you die, go into it deeply. Your physical form is dissolving, is no more. Then a moment comes when all mind forms or thoughts also die, yet you are still there the divine presence that you are, radiant, fully awake. The realization of this deathless dimension, your true nature, is the other side of compassion? On a deep feeling level, you now recognize not only your own immortality, but through your own that of every other creature as well. On the level of form, you share mortality and the precariousness of existence. On the level of being, you share eternal, radiant life. These are the two aspects of compassion. In compassion, the seemingly opposite feelings of sadness and joy merge into one and become transmuted into a deep inner peace. This is the peace of God. It is one of the most noble feelings that humans are capable of, and it has great healing and transformative power. But true compassion, as I have just described it, is as yet rare, toward a different order of reality. I don't agree that the body needs to die. I am convinced that we can achieve physical immortality. We believe in death, and that's why the body dies. The body does not die because you believe in death. The body exists, or seems to, because you believe in death. Body and death are part of the same illusion, created by the egoic mode of consciousness, which has no awareness of the source of life, and sees itself as separate and constantly under threat. So it creates the illusion that you are a body, a dense, physical vehicle that is constantly under threat. To perceive yourself as a vulnerable body that was born and a little later dies, that's the illusion. Body and death, one illusion. You cannot have one without the other. You want to keep one side of the illusion and get rid of the other, but that is impossible. Either you keep all of it or you relinquish all of it. However, you cannot escape from the body nor do you have to. The body is an incredible misperception of your true nature. But your true nature is concealed somewhere within that illusion, not outside it. So the body is still the only point of access to it. If you saw an angel but mistook it for a stone statue, all you would have to do is adjust your vision and look more closely at the stone statue, not start looking somewhere else. You would then find that there never was a stone statue. If belief in death creates the body, why does an animal have a body? An animal doesn't have an ego, and it doesn't believe in death. But it still dies, or seems to. Remember that your perception of the world is a reflection of your state of consciousness. You are not separate from it, and there is no objective world out there. Every moment, your consciousness creates the world that you inhabit. One of the greatest insights that has come out of modern physics is that of the unity between the observer and the observed. The person conducting the experiment, the observing consciousness cannot be separated from the observed phenomena. And a different way of looking causes the observed phenomena to behave differently. If you believe on a deep level in separation and the struggle for survival, then you see that belief reflected all around you and your perceptions are governed by fear. You inhabit a world of death and of bodies fighting killing, and devouring each other. Nothing is what it seems to be. The world that you create and see through the egoic mind may seem a very imperfect place, even a veil of tears. But whatever you perceive is only a kind of symbol, like an image in a dream. It is how your consciousness interprets and interacts with the molecular energy dance of the universe. This energy is the raw material of so-called physical reality. You see it in terms of bodies and birth and death, or as a struggle for survival. An infinite number of completely different interpretations, completely different worlds, is possible and, in fact, exists all depending on the perceiving consciousness. Every being is a focal point of consciousness, and every such focal point creates its own world. Although all those worlds are interconnected, there is a human world, an ant world, a dolphin world, and so on. There are countless beings whose consciousness frequency is so different from yours that you are probably unaware of their existence, as they are of yours. Highly conscious beings who are aware of their connectedness with the source and with each other would inhabit a world that to you would appear as a heavenly realm and yet all worlds are ultimately one. Since all worlds are interconnected, when collective human consciousness becomes transformed, 
nature and the animal kingdom will reflect that transformation. Hence the statement in the Bible that in the coming age, the lion shall lie down with the lamb. This points to the possibility of a completely different order of reality. The world as it appears to us now is, as I said, largely a reflection of the egoic mind, fear being an unavoidable consequence of egoic delusion. It is a world dominated by fear. Just as the images in a dream are symbols of inner states and feelings, so our collective reality is largely a symbolic expression of fear, and of the heavy layers of negativity, that have accumulated in the collective human psyche. We are not separate from our world. So when the majority of humans become free of egoic delusion, this inner change will affect all of creation. You will literally inhabit a new world. It is a shift in planetary consciousness. The strange Buddhist saying that every tree and every blade of grass will eventually become enlightened points to the same truth. According to St. Paul, the whole of creation is waiting for humans to become enlightened. That is how I interpret his saying that the created universe is waiting with eager expectation for God's sons to be revealed. St. Paul goes on to say that all of creation will become redeemed through this. Up to the present, the whole created universe in all its parts groans, as if in the pangs of childbirth. But don't confuse cause and effect. Your primary task is not to seek salvation through creating a better world, but to awaken out of identification with form. You are then no longer bound to this world, this level of reality. You can feel your roots in the unmanifested, and so are free of attachment to the manifested world. You can still enjoy the passing pleasures of this world, but there is no fear of loss anymore, so you don't need to cling to them. Although you can enjoy sensory pleasures, the craving for sensory experience is gone, as is the constant search for fulfillment through psychological gratification, through feeding the ego. In a way, you then don't need the world anymore. You don't even need it to be different from the way it is. It is only at this point that you begin to make a real contribution toward bringing about a better world, toward creating a different order of reality. It is only at this point that you are able to feel true compassion and to help others at the level of cause. Only those who have transcended the world can bring about a better world. You may remember that we talked about the dual nature of true compassion which is awareness of a common bond of shared mortality and immortality. At this deep level, compassion becomes healing in the widest sense. In that state, your healing influence is primarily based not on doing, but on being. Everybody you come in contact with will be touched by your presence and affected by the peace that you emanate, whether they are conscious of it or not. When you are fully present and people around you manifest unconscious behavior, you won't feel the need to react to it so you don't give it any reality. Your peace is so vast and deep that anything that is not peace disappears into it, as if it had never existed. This breaks the karmic cycle of action and reaction. Animals, trees, flowers will feel your peace and respond to it. You teach through being, through demonstrating the peace of God. You become the light of the world, an emanation of pure consciousness, and so you eliminate suffering on the level of cause. You eliminate unconsciousness from the world. This doesn't mean that you may not also teach through doing, for example, by pointing out how to disidentify from the mind, recognize unconscious patterns within oneself, and so on. But who you are is always a more vital teaching and a more powerful transformer of the world than what you say, and more essential even than what you do. Furthermore, to recognize the primacy of being, and thus work on the level of cause, does not exclude the possibility that your compassion may simultaneously manifest on the level of doing and of effect, by alleviating suffering whenever you come across it. When a hungry person asks you for bread and you have some, you will give it. But as you give the bread, even though your interaction may only be very brief, what really matters is this moment of shared being of which the bread is only a symbol. A deep healing takes place within it. In that moment, there is no giver, no receiver. But there shouldn't be any hunger and starvation in the first place. How can we create a better world without tackling evils such as hunger and violence first? All evils are the effect of unconsciousness. You can alleviate the effects of unconsciousness, but you cannot eliminate them unless you eliminate their cause. True change happens within not without. This also applies if you are supporting a movement designed to stop deeply unconscious humans from destroying themselves, each other, and the planet, 
or from continuing to inflict dreadful suffering on other sentient beings. Remember, lust is you cannot fight the darkness, so you cannot fight unconsciousness. If you try to do so, the polar opposites will become strengthened and more deeply entrenched. You will become identified with one of the polarities. You will create an enemy, and so be drawn into unconsciousness yourself. Raise awareness by disseminating information, or at the most practice passive resistance. But make sure that you carry no resistance within. No hatred. No negativity. Love your enemies, said Jesus. Which, of course, means have no enemies. Once you get involved in working on the level of effect, it is all too easy to lose yourself in it. Stay alert and very, very present. The causal level needs to remain your primary focus, the teaching of enlightenment your main purpose, and peace your most precious gift to the world. The meaning of surrender, acceptance of the now. You mentioned surrender a few times. I don't like that idea. It sounds somewhat fatalistic. If we always accept the way things are, we are not going to make any effort to improve them. It seems to me what progress is all about, both in our personal lives and collectively, is not to accept the limitations of the present, but to strive to go beyond them and create something better. It becomes particularly pronounced when things go wrong, which means that there is a gap between the demands or rigid expectations mind and what is. Is the have lived I on enough? You will know that things go wrong quite often. It is precisely at those times that surrender needs to be practiced if you want to eliminate pain and sorrow from your life. Acceptance of what is immediately frees you from mind identification and thus reconnects you with being. Resistance is the mind. Surrender is a purely inner phenomenon. It does riot mean that on the outer level you cannot take action and change the situation. In fact, it is not the overall situation that you need to accept when you surrender, but just the tiny segment called the now. For example, if you were stuck in the mud somewhere, you wouldn't say, okay, I resign myself to being stuck in the mud. Resignation is not surrender. You don't need to accept an undesirable or unpleasant life situation, nor do you need to deceive yourself and say that there is nothing wrong with being stuck in the mud. No. You recognize fully that you want to get out of it. You then narrow your attention down to the present moment without mentally labeling it in any way. This means that there is no judgment of the now. Therefore, there is no resistance, no emotional negativity. You accept the isness of this moment. Then you take action and do all that you can to get out of the mud. Such action I call positive action. It is far more effective than negative action which arises out of anger, despair, or frustration. Until you achieve the desired result, you continue to practice surrender by refraining from labeling the now. Let me give you a visual analogy to illustrate the point I am making. You are walking along a path at night, surrounded by a thick fog, but you have a powerful flashlight that cuts through the fog and creates a narrow, clear space in front of you. The fog is your life situation, which includes past and future. The flashlight is your conscious presence. The clear space is the now. Even nature becomes your enemy, and your perceptions and interpretations are governed by fear. The mental disease that we call paranoia is only a slightly more acute form of this normal but dysfunctional state of consciousness. Not only your psychological form, but also your physical form your body becomes hard and rigid through resistance. Tension arises in different parts of the body, and the body as a whole contracts. The free flow of life energy through the body, which is essential for its healthy functioning, is greatly restricted. Bodywork and certain forms of physical therapy can be helpful in restoring this flow. But unless you practice surrender in your everyday life, those things can only give temporary symptom relief. Since the cause the resistance pattern has not been dissolved, there is something within you that remains unaffected by the transient circumstances that make up your life situation, and only through surrender do you have access to it. It is your life, your very being which exists eternally in the timeless realm of the present. Finding this life is the one thing that is needed that Jesus talked about. If you find your life situation unsatisfactory or even intolerable, it is only by surrendering first that you can break the unconscious resistance pattern that perpetuates that situation. Surrender is perfectly compatible with taking action, initiating change or achieving goals. But in the surrendered state a totally different energy, 
a different quality flows into your doing. Surrender reconnects you with the source energy of being, and if your doing is infused with being, it becomes a joyful celebration of life energy that takes you more deeply into the now. Through non-resistance, the quality of your consciousness and, therefore, the quality of whatever you are doing or creating, is enhanced immeasurably. The results will then look after themselves and reflect that quality. We could call this surrendered action. It is not work as we have known it for thousands of years. As more humans awaken, the word work is going to disappear from our vocabulary, and perhaps a new word will be created to replace it. It is the quality of your consciousness at this moment that is the main determinant of what kind of future you will experience. So to surrender is the most important thing you can do to bring about positive change. Any action you take is secondary. No truly positive action can arise out of an unsurrendered state of consciousness. I can see that if I am in a situation that is unpleasant or unsatisfactory, and I completely accept the moment as it is. There will be no suffering or unhappiness. I will have risen above it. But I still can't quite see where the energy or motivation for tatting action and bringing about change would come from if there isn't a certain amount of dissatisfaction. In the state of surrender, you see very clearly what needs to be done. And you take action, doing one thing at a time, and focusing on one thing at a time. Learn from nature. See how everything gets accomplished and how the miracle of life unfolds without dissatisfaction or unhappiness. That's why Jesus said, Look at the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. If your overall situation is unsatisfactory or unpleasant, separate out this instant and surrender to what is. That's the flashlight cutting through the fog. Your state of consciousness then ceases to be controlled by external conditions. You are no longer coming from reaction and resistance. Then look at the specifics of the situation. Ask yourself, is there anything I can do to change the situation, improve it, or remove myself from it? If so, you take appropriate action. Focus not on the two things that you will or may have to do at some future time, but on the one thing that you can do now. This doesn't mean you should not do any planning. It may well be that planning is the one thing you can do now, but make sure you don't start to run mental movies project yourself into the future, and so lose the now. Any action you take may not bear fruit immediately. Until it does do not resist what is, life becomes helpful and cooperative. If inner factors such as fear, guilt, or inertia prevented you from taking action, they will dissolve in the light of your conscious presence. Do not confuse surrender with an attitude of I can't be bothered anymore, or I just don't care anymore. If you look at it closely, you will find that such an attitude is tainted with negativity in the form of hidden resentment, and so is not surrender at all but massed resistance. As you surrender, direct your attention inward to check if there is any trace of resistance left inside you. Be very alert when you do so. Otherwise, a pocket of resistance may continue to hide in some dark corner, in the form of a thought or an unacknowledged emotion. From mind energy to spiritual energy, Letting go of resistance is easier said than done. I still don't see clearly how to let go. If you say it is by surrendering, the question remains, how? By focusing all your attention on the now, the unconscious resistance is made conscious, and that is the end of it. You cannot be conscious and unhappy, conscious and in negativity, negativity, unhappiness, or suffering in whatever form means that there is resistance, and resistance is always unconscious. Surely I can be conscious of my unhappy feelings. Would you choose unhappiness? If you did not choose it, how did it arise? What is its purpose? Who is keeping it alive? You say that you are conscious of your unhappy feelings, but the truth is that you are identified with them and keep the process alive through compulsive thinking. All that is unconscious. If you were conscious, that is to say totally present in the now. All negativity would dissolve almost instantly. It could not survive in your presence. It can only survive in your absence. Even the pain body cannot survive for long in your presence. You keep your unhappiness alive by giving it time. That is its lifeblood. Remove time through intense present moment awareness, and it dies. But do you want it to die? Have you truly had enough? Who would you be without it? Until you practice surrender. The spiritual dimension is something you read about, talk about, get excited about, write books about, think about, believe in or don't. 
as the case may be. It makes no difference. Not until you surrender does it become a living reality in your life. When you do, the energy that you emanate and which then runs your life is of a much higher vibrational frequency than the mind energy that still runs our world the energy that created the existing social, political, and economic structures of our civilization and which also continuously perpetuates itself through our educational systems and the media. Through surrender, spiritual energy comes into this world. It creates no suffering for yourself, for other humans, or any other life form on the planet. Unlike mind energy, it does not pollute the earth, and it is not subject to the law of polarities, which dictates that nothing can exist without its opposite that there can be no good without bad. Those who run on mind energy, which is still the vast majority of the Earth's population, remain unaware of the existence of spiritual energy. It belongs to a different order of reality and will create a different world when a sufficient number of humans enter the surrendered state and so become totally free of negativity. If the Earth is to survive, this will be the energy of those who inhabit it. Jesus referred to this energy when he made his famous prophetic statement in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the gentle, they shall have the earth for their possession. It is a silent but intense presence that dissolves the unconscious patterns of the mind. They may still remain active for a while, but they won't run your life anymore. The external conditions that were being resisted also tend to shift or dissolve quickly through surrender. It is a powerful transformer of situations and people. If conditions do not shift immediately, your acceptance of the now enables you to rise above them. Either way, you are free. Surrender in personal relationships. What about people who want to use me, manipulate or control me? Am I to surrender to them? They are cut off from being so they unconsciously attempt to get energy and power from you. It is true that only an unconscious person will try to use or manipulate others, but it is equally true that only an unconscious person can be used and manipulated. If you resist or fight unconscious behavior in others, you become unconscious yourself. But surrender doesn't mean that you allow yourself to be used by unconscious people. Not at all. It is perfectly possible to say no firmly and clearly to a person, or to walk away from a situation, and be in a state of complete inner non-resistance at the same time. When you say no to a person or a situation, let it come not from reaction but from insight, from a clear realization of what is right or not right for you at that moment. Let it be a non-reactive no, a high-quality no, a no that is free of all negativity, and so creates no further suffering. I am in a situation at work that is unpleasant. I have tried to surrender to it, but I find it impossible. A lot of resistance keeps coming up. If you cannot surrender, take action immediately. Speak up or do something to bring about a change in the situation, or remove yourself from it. Take responsibility for your life. Do not pollute your beautiful, radiant inner being nor the earth with negativity. Do not give unhappiness in any form whatsoever a dwelling place inside you. If you cannot take action, for example if you are in prison, then you have two choices left. Resistance or surrender. Bondage or inner freedom from external conditions. Suffering or inner peace. Is non-resistance also to be practiced in the external conduct of our lives, such as non-resistance to violence, or is it something that just concerns our inner life? You only need to be concerned with the inner aspect. That is primary. Of course, that will also transform the conduct of your outer life, your relationships, and so on. Your relationships will be changed profoundly by surrender. If you can never accept what is, by implication you will not be able to accept anybody the way they are. You will judge, criticize, label, reject, or attempt to change people. Furthermore, if you continuously make the now into a means to an end in the future, you will also make every person you encounter or relate with into a means to an end. The relationship the human being is then of secondary importance to you, or of no importance at all. What you can get out of the relationship is primary be it material gain, a sense of power, physical pleasure, or some form of ego gratification. Let me illustrate how surrender can work in relationships. When you become involved in an argument or some conflict situation, perhaps with a partner or someone close to you, 
Start by observing how defensive you become as your own position is attacked, or feel the force of your own aggression as you attack the other person's position. Observe the attachment to your views and opinions. I don't mean dropping the reaction just verbally by saying, okay, you are right, with a look on your face that says, I am above all this childish unconsciousness. That's just displacing the resistance to another level. With the egoic mind still in charge, claiming superiority, I am speaking of letting go of the entire mental-emotional energy field inside you that was fighting for power. The ego is cunning, so you have to be very alert, very present, and totally honest with yourself to see whether you have truly relinquished your identification with a mental position, and so freed yourself from your mind. If you suddenly feel very light, clear and deeply at peace, that is an unmistakable sign that you have truly surrendered. Then observe what happens to the other person's mental position, as you no longer energize it through resistance. When identification with mental positions is out of the way, true communication begins. What about non-resistance in the face of violence, aggression, and the like? Non-resistance doesn't necessarily mean doing nothing. All it means is that any doing becomes non-reactive. Remember the deep wisdom underlying the practice of Eastern martial arts. Don't resist the opponent's force. Yield to overcome. Having said that, doing nothing when you are in a state of intense presence is a very powerful transformer and healer of situations and people. In Taoism, there is a term called Wu Wei which is usually translated as actionless activity, or sitting quietly doing nothing. In ancient China, this was regarded as one of the highest achievements or virtues. It is radically different from inactivity in the ordinary state of consciousness, or rather unconsciousness, which stems from fear, inertia, or indecision. The real doing nothing implies inner non-resistance and intense alertness. On the other hand, if action is required, you will no longer react from your conditioned mind, but you will respond to the situation out of your conscious presence. In that state, your mind is free of concepts, including the concept of nonviolence. So who can predict what you will do? The ego believes that in your resistance lies your strength, whereas in truth resistance cuts you off from being the only place of true power. Resistance is weakness and fear masquerading as strength. What the ego sees as weakness is your being in its purity, innocence, and power. What it sees as strength is weakness. So the ego exists in a continuous resistance mode and plays counterfeit roles to cover up your weakness, which in truth is your power, until there is surrender. Unconscious role-playing constitutes a large part of human interaction. In surrender, you no longer need ego defenses and false masks. You become very simple, very real. That's dangerous, says the ego. You'll get hurt. You'll become vulnerable. What the ego doesn't know, of course, is that only through the letting go of resistance, through becoming vulnerable, can you discover your true and essential invulnerability. Transforming illness into enlightenment. If someone is seriously ill and completely accepts their condition and surrenders to the illness, would they not have given up their will to get back to health? The determination to fight the illness would not be there anymore, would it? Surrender is inner acceptance of what is without any reservations. We are talking about your I re this instant, not the conditions or circumstances of your life, not what I call your life situation. We have spoken about this already. With regard to illness, this is what it means. Illness is part of your life situation. As such, it has a past and a future. Past and future form an uninterrupted continuum. Unless the redeeming power of the now is activated through your conscious presence. As you know, underneath the various conditions that make up your life situation, which exists in time, there is something deeper, more essential. Your life, your very being in the timeless now. As there are no problems in the now, there is no illness either. The belief in a label that someone attaches to your condition keeps the condition in place, empowers it, and makes a seemingly solid reality out of a temporary imbalance. It gives it not only reality and solidity, but also a continuity in time that it did not have before. By focusing on this instant and refraining from labeling it mentally, illness is reduced to one or several of these factors. Physical pain, weakness, discomfort, or disability. 
That is what you surrender to now. You do not surrender to the idea of illness. Allow the suffering to force you into the present moment, into a state of intense conscious presence. Use it for enlightenment. Surrender does not transform what is, at least not directly. Surrender transforms you. When you are transformed, your whole world is transformed, because the world is only a reflection. We spoke about this earlier. If you looked in the mirror and did not like what you saw, you would have to be mad to attack the image in the mirror. That is precisely what you do when you are in a state of non-acceptance. And, of course, if you attack the image, it attacks you back. If you accept the image, no matter what it is, if you become friendly toward it, it cannot not become friendly toward you. This is how you change the world. Illness is not the problem. You are the problem as long as the egoic mind is in control. When you are ill or disabled, do not feel that you have failed in some way. Do not feel guilty. Do not blame life for treating you unfairly, but do not blame yourself either. All that is resistance. If you have a major illness, use it for enlightenment. Anything bad that happens in your life use it for enlightenment. Withdraw time from the illness. Do not give it any past or future. Let it force you into intense present moment awareness and see what happens. Become an alchemist. Transmute base metal into gold. Suffering into consciousness. Disaster into enlightenment. Are you seriously ill and feeling angry now about what I have just said? Then that is a clear sign that the illness has become part of your sense of self and that you are now protecting your identity as well as protecting the illness. The condition that is labeled illness has nothing to do with who you truly are. When disaster strikes, as far as the still unconscious majority of the population is concerned, only a critical limit situation has the potential to crack the hard shell of the ego and force them into surrender and so into the awakened state. A limit situation arises when through some disaster, drastic upheaval, deep loss, or suffering your whole world is shattered and doesn't make sense anymore. It is an encounter with death, be it physical or psychological. The egoic mind, the creator of this world, collapses. Out of the ashes of the old world, a new world can then come into being. There is no guarantee, of course, that even a limit situation will do it. But the potential is always there. Some people's resistance to what is even intensifies in such a situation, and so it becomes a descent into hell. In others, there may only be partial surrender, but even that will give them a certain depth and serenity that were not there before. Parts of the ego shall break off, and this allows small amounts of the radiance and peace that lie beyond the mind to shine through. Limit situations have produced many miracles. There have been murderers in death row waiting for execution, who, in the last few hours of their lives, experienced the egoless state, and the deep joy found themselves in became so intense as to produce unbearable suffering, and there was nowhere to run, and nothing to do to escape it, not even a mind-projected future. So they were forced into complete acceptance of the unacceptable. They were forced into surrender. In this way, they were able to enter the state of grace with which comes redemption. Complete release from the past. Of course, it is not really the limit situation that makes room for the miracle of grace and redemption, but the act of surrender. So whenever any kind of disaster strikes, or something goes seriously wrong illness, disability, Loss of home or fortune or of a socially defined identity. Breakup of a dose relationship. Death or suffering of a loved one. Or your own impending death No, That there is another side to it. That you are just one step away from something incredible. A complete alchemical transmutation of the base metal of pain and suffering into gold. That one step is called surrender. I do not mean to say that you will become happy in such a situation. You will not. But fear and pain will become transmuted into an inner peace and serenity that come from a very deep place, from the unmanifested itself. It is the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Compared to that, happiness is quite a shallow thing. With this radiant peace comes the realization not on the level of mind, but within the depth of your being that you are indestructible, immortal. This is not a belief, it is absolute certainty that needs no external evidence or proof from some secondary source. Transforming Suffering INT0 Peace I read about a Stoic philosopher in ancient Greece, who, when he was told that his son had died in an accident, 
replied, I knew he was not immortal. Is that surrender? If it is, I don't want it. There are some situations in which surrender seems unnatural and inhuman. Being cut off from your feelings is not surrender. But we don't know what his inner state was when he said those words. Incertain. No. But you always get a second chance at surrender. Your first chance is to surrender each moment to the reality of that moment. Knowing that what is cannot be undone because it already is you say yes to what is or accept what isn't. Then you do what you have to do. Whatever the situation requires. If you abide in this state of acceptance, you create no more negativity, no more suffering, no more unhappiness. You then live in a state of non-resistance, a state of grace and lightness, free of struggle. Whenever you are unable to do that, whenever you miss that chance either, because you are not generating enough conscious presence to prevent some habitual and unconscious resistance pattern from arising, or because the condition is so extreme as to be absolutely unacceptable to you, then you are creating some form of pain, some form of suffering. It may look as if the situation is creating the suffering, but ultimately this is not so your resistance is. Now here is your second chance at surrender. If you cannot accept what is outside, then accept what is inside. If you cannot accept the external condition, accept the internal condition. This means, do not resist the pain, allow it to be there. Surrender to the grief, despair, fear, loneliness, or whatever form the suffering takes. Witness it without labeling it mentally. Embrace it. Then see how the miracle of surrender transmutes deep suffering into deep peace. This is your crucifixion. Let it become your resurrection and ascension. I do not see how one can surrender to suffering. As you yourself pointed out, 